Hello and welcome to the Computomics podcast. Our guest today is a global professional with over 25 years experience in the grain, malting and brewing industries. He is currently a principal owner, board member and managing director for RMI Analytics based in Switzerland and has a focus on driving RMI's content delivery through journal publication, webinars and global insights tours. Welcome to the Computomics podcast, Brent Adhill. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, and it's a pleasure being with you today and uh, uh, looking forward to having a conversation. As am I. Uh, we do like to start the conversation a little bit uh, with an icebreaker, kind of left fieldish. ish uh, <laughs> um, And given your industry background, I couldn't help but ask myself, what is your favorite beer and why? Uh, fairly easy question. Well, first of all, I, I love beer for, for different reasons, but the one in particular I would say is Pilsner Urquell from from the Czech region uh, because it's the the original Pils, and that's probably my style of beer. But it's also a very a very good beer and a lot of history behind it. So, uh, for anyone listening, if you ever get a chance to go to Pils in in, um, in Czechia, the, I would highly recommend it. It's probably one of the most beautiful brewing sites that that I've seen in my travels. Wow. And the beer's good. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great combo. It tastes good, a special brewery place, and the histor historic significance of, of being... Uh, it's, worth, yeah. it's certainly worth the trip. Yep, yeah, for sure. All right. We, we have that in the bank. We will add that to the, to the show notes as well um, so people can check it out. Um, now... Again, given your background with with beer and that much experience, um, what would you say is the country with the highest beer consumption? Well, it, by coincidence, I would say it is the Czech Czech Republic. If you still refer to it that way, they they're at uh, somewhere between 120 and 130 liters per capita of oh. adult consumers. So, um, the Czech uh, the Czech culture is quite a good beer one, of course, and they enjoy their their beverage uh, of choice. Interesting side fact to that is because Prague is such a tourist destination, one of the distortions in the numbers is uh, a lot of people go to Prague, as an example, and spend the weekend enjoying a lot of the Czech beer. And that actually has a small inflation impact to the to the overall volume numbers. But it's uh, it's uh, it's not alone in that case. Uh, the Czechs themselves are, are good beer drinkers. But they get a further bump from the tourist side. Right. And we're going to make it even worse, given given the tip you just had at the very beginning. <laughs> um, interesting. And uh, what what are the trends in in beer consumption that you see? Are there is there anything that you that has changed maybe within the last five to 10 years that you can see? Well, the longer term trend is really the fact that people generally are, are consuming less beer and, and I would say overall probably less alcohol in general. So we are seeing that. But it's much more complicated just because uh, markets aren't the same. It's not homogeneous around the world. So we've got mature markets like U.S. or Canada or Western Europe that are uh, as mature markets. They're not they're not growing from a beer perspective. Um, but you know the other side of the coin is uh, emerging markets, being South America or Africa or Southeast Asia, are growing a lot, and that's that's where you know, the opportunity lies as well for the future. So. The answer to your question is is kind of two two separate ones potentially depending which part of the world or which markets you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, beer is beer has struggled in the last ten to fifteen years to sustain growth just because it's fighting some of those pressures of more health conscious consumers and people wanting to to make uh, better choices in some respects. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a it's a it's an ongoing challenge for brewing and the alcohol industry more widely. For sure. So I would assume then that non or low alcohol beer has gotten much more of a market share, even like within the beer consumption that is still happening. Yeah, for sure. It's still very small in terms of the the overall proportion of the of the beverage industry. So so beer is the best example, but you also see it expanding. So you start to see non alcohol wines and some people making non alcohol gin, for example. So even in spirits. So. So there is a lot of effort behind it um, for that potential going forward. But of course, it is it is still in the infancy. So it's very small volume-wise. But um, clearly, the, the mega trend is, is certainly positive for that, that segment. Mm -hmm. 
And in the new emerging mar markets that you mentioned, are are they more traditional in their consumption or does that maybe higher part of non-alcohol beer also, is, is it also seen there? Yeah, a little bit. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's different if I say it that way. The, one of the benefits of emerging markets is the fact that the economies themselves are growing. So you've got mm -hmm. um, less disposable income, for example. So, so they're actually, in a, they're in a totally different place. Maybe they don't maybe have this, the same amount of disposable income. So, they would probably buy more mainstream beers because they, they're more affordable. Mm -hmm. But but the way the brewing industry looks at it is over time as they as the economies develop and as people earn more money and therefore have more disposable income, they by human nature they do tend to to try to enjoy the better things in life. So in the beer example, they would try to eventually grow where they move from a mainstream beer or even economical beer brand to something more premium so mm -hmm. everyone wants the finer things in life and this is an example even in beer that people would like to ultimately be able to um, drink a premium product and by holding a premium product they are in a way kind of demonstrating some of their financial um, benefit mm -hmm. yeah that makes makes total sense one thing that i noticed or it might obviously this is just my one person um, seeing things so so the data might be off but i got the sense that there's more microbreweries around and more craft beer so because we're based in germany um and here the the you're actually not like the, with the line heights with the the rules for what you can put in beer um for a long time craft beer had a had a bit of a hard starting spot maybe <laughs> but even there you can see it now that it's becoming more of a, a trend and people like to experiment and like you said maybe try different tastes and be a little bit more selective in what they drink yeah yeah for sure and and, and that's that's a that's a global phenomenon as well right it would have you could say it started in the u.s and in the craft industry in the mm. u.s is is indicative of that and uh, but it is spreading more globally but uh, it it does fit what, what you said and what i said come together in the Consumers, if they want something premium, craft is premium. It's also artesian or craft, mm -hmm. and it's made locally. So these things are are all beneficial in terms of supporting craft in the in the growth of of beer. Mm -hmm. And can I just say to our audience, if you hear something in the background, uh, you have to know our guest is uh, is always on the move in his job. So we are actually uh, talking with him. We have the luxury of talking to him while he's traveling. So if you hear a little bit of laughter in the background or uh, sounds like that, uh, that's what it is, just so you know where we're at. Um, I, I really appreciate that you you took the time, even under these circumstances, being like, wh where are you even? I didn't even ask. Which airport lounge? I, I'm in Helsinki, just on my way oh. back to Switzerland. So uh, Nice. I was up looking at a brand new malting facility in Finland. So it's all related. It's, as an example, that's some of what we do. Someone's investing some money to keep the keep the supply chain modern and, and uh, fulfilling a, a much needed uh, function. So, uh, yeah. That's uh, as, as an example. That's the sort of thing we try to shed some light on these things uh, where people are making investments or, or really putting some effort into to moving things forward. Nice. Well, Brent, uh, you've you've been in the brewing and malting industries for a super long time. Um, I was wondering what made you stay loyal to basically more or less one crop, malt barley hops, throughout your career. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say necessarily it was by de by design, but I guess um, kind of in some ways my career has followed a, a natural path. I was in grain related industry and dealing with farmers, and and the next step in my career, which was moving from grain to processed grain, that was the malting industry, and the third stage was really after you've created malt and it goes into brewing, then. You kind of make the next step in the ladder, and uh, as I say, it wasn't by design, but it was um, kind of somewhat natural in, in one sense. But uh, mm -hmm. the the main part is I enjoy the the industry is rather unique, so there it's not uh, it's certainly not mundane, and there's it's a uh, it's something that has a, a bit of a, a life of its own. So it's it's quite <laughs> interesting that way. I mean that that just begs the natural follow up. What is unique about the industry? Well. The malt, well, if you go all the way back to barley, malting barley in itself, but even malting barley is very much a niche crop. So 
it's not corn or maize or wheat on the big picture. It's it's something quite quite unique and and that means it's special in that respect. And it's it's driven by a lot of factors. Some are directly within the barley world and in other cases it's impacted by outside forces like corn and wheat and these things. So it's uh, it's unique, never a dull moment, I could say possibly, <laughs> but uh with that it's um yeah, it brings. Uh, I give you an example. I've had people that I've worked with in the past that have gone on to do other things, and they and keeping in touch with them, they've often say they really miss it because it's it's mm. unique and it's got that certain special feel to it. So there's there's certainly that part um, draws people in. Mm-hmm. Makes makes sense. Yeah, and I guess with RMI, you're you're in the middle of it. You you you're providing certain services. Can you can you give us a, a bit of an intro to the work that RMI is doing? Sure. Well, I guess the way we, what RMI does, I guess we we provide a, I guess I would say a, a a specific function in the supply chain. First of all, we're we're unbiased, so we're we're not buying or selling um, barley or malt or anything in that way. So we're we we don't have a really a vested interest other than we're just trying to gather the insights that we feel are important mm-hmm. and and put our put our take on it, give our our, our thoughts of what's the relevance of these things, and we pass that back to our clients and and through our through our monthly newsletter and so on. And that's the that's the value that we do is to is to take my experience and and relay it to people and so on. So that's um, uh, our primary role. It's really market information, uh, supply and demand information uh, that we that we put our thought process to and. And share those insights. People don't have to agree with it all the time, but they mm-hmm. can they can certainly take it for for what it's worth and where it's coming from. And of course, if people have questions, they they don't hesitate to reach out to me and and uh, try to uh, um, delve in a little deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe given that you you provide such market insights, if you can, can you name one at the moment where you say like, okay, maybe in the last edition of the newsletter or one that just um, uh, stuck in your mind that that's would be an example would be a what would be a current market insight? Well, we're we're in the middle. So there's a there's a seasonality to it. So we're in the summer season in Northern Hemisphere. And that comes with with weather issues. So we've had a very you're based in Germany. So you could think of uh, the last month has been abnormally warm and mm. abnormally dry, um, which might be good for for beer consumption, but it's not good for <laughs> crops like barley and wheat. So, so those mm. are insights. So, right at the moment, we're dealing with potentially a, a smaller barley crop than we thought two months ago. Um, it's still, and it's a smaller crop for sure than what we had last year. So, so we've been through a rough period. We had some drought issues in the past two years. Uh, we were hoping this year would be a return to normal, um, but so far we're seeing still a few a few new issues popping up. So, uh, back to the earlier point, it's just a, another example of the of the, the aspect of it that it keeps it keeps it interesting because there's these these uh, forces that are impacting it uh, can come from different places, and many times you don't have a chance to anticipate. You are more reactive to them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean. I, I I was gonna, or this is actually that this leads very well into another topic that I was thinking about, um, especially given that you have such extensive background in supply chain strategies, developing them. Um, what challenges do you see in the barley supply chain, both at the moment, but also obviously looking into the future? Well, if, if you think of it from the farmer's perspective, something that I keep in the front of my mind on a regular basis is I all, almost always try to put myself in the shoes of the farmer because mm. um, farmers have choice. They can grow other crops. They don't have to grow barley. They don't have to grow malting barley. So it's quite important to to keep that at the front because it all starts with them. You, without barley, you won't have malt. And without malt, you're not going to have the beers that you're traditionally familiar with. So so I think I, I often take it back to um, maybe sometimes it's, it's a bit forgotten that um, the farmers maybe assume that they'll continue to to do things as, as they've done in the past, but you have to be careful not to, to go too far with that and, and assume that they'll um, continue. So uh, there's, there's always that, there's always that aspect around um, making, keeping malting and barley relevant for the farmer would be the key point. Mm-hmm. And, and how would you, like, if, if you're, if we're talking strategy, how, 
are we going about doing that? As an industry, in the, the things that uh, you see all the time, you you think about variety development and, and bringing new varieties to the table that are higher yielding or provide better disease resistance. And, and these things directly lead to a better outcome for the farmer, better yield or, or a better quality outcome that um, gives you a better chance to, to be selected, if we call it that for, for malting barley. I guess maybe a key point that would be good for the audience to think about where we are in the world. Um, as a rule of thumb, at the moment, we produce about 150 million tons of barley each year, 150 metric, mm -hmm. million metric tons of barley. We use about 25 million metric tons of barley, malting barley, for malt production. So we really we use one out of six tons of barley for the malting process for brewing and distilling and food. The other five out of six tons of barley goes into, into the feed segment, mm, feeding mm -hmm. cattle and so on. So the why that's important to know is that we in one way we would say for for malting purposes, we select the best of the barley. So whatever the quality is best of those varieties that are approved for growing and malting, they're selected. So the farmer wants to have the best quality because they want to get in that one out of six um, mm -hmm. ton selection rate because they do get paid a premium for malting barley versus versus feed barley. So that that piece is quite important. And uh, um, all these things that are done, new varieties, new um, inputs, new chemicals, reducing disease or um, um, warding off insect damage and so on, they all have a direct correlation to, to the farmer's uh, result, both yield and quality. So it's very mm -hmm. important. Uh, yeah, makes makes total sense. Um, I guess you you just mentioned providing more resistant varieties because we were talking or you were mentioning before climate change, droughts, high temperatures. These are these are challenges that are not going to be going away anytime soon. Um, what role do you see for technology in in tackling these cha these challenges, but also other the other challenges that the supply chain is. Um, yeah, well, like like almost in any part, not not just in agriculture, but in almost any facet of life, data is important. So the more data you have, you can learn from that. The plant breeders, for example, that are creating new varieties, data is very important for them because the more data they have, certainly from they would they might have as an example, they might have a thousand new um, variety lines to choose mm -hmm. from. But they need to, out of that thousand, they need to down select to 100. And then those 100 will be reduced down to five. And eventually, one or two of those thousand will eventually pass through. So you need the best of the best. And, and really, you can't make those decisions without, without data. So you, you do that. And if you're looking at inputs, fertilizer, and chemical applications, that's all data driven. You run field trials, you do one field with fertilizer, or one without, or one with new fertilizer versus the the baseline or the traditional and the differences between those are all pieces of data that help you decide what to to do going forward in terms of selecting either a new variety or a new um, production process mm -hmm. uh, is that something that you're employing at rmi too for example uh you know artificial intelligence or or other tech mm, not not directly for us. The, on top of the, it's part of the insights. We spend a lot of time going out to see what's going on. So we would maybe go and investigate what are those new variety trials or what are these new farm practices that are being developed, and mm -hmm. we would report that back. So some of it would be sharing best practice. We're not, we're not involved in the final decision, but we, as an RMI function, we view our role is, is to make sure we know what's going on and inform. The people in our network of of what to do, they can they can come through us to find out more, or go directly to the people doing the work, and and that's that sharing of best practice, and mm -hmm. and that should spawn those ideas that are applied more widely, or it might trigger a, a further development that's another step change to a better place. So so uh, it's a bit more of a communication and marketing of those best practices, but it still serves a an important function. And it's back to my point, it's about keeping people informed and and uh, helping them in their their own decision making and strategy development which was your earlier question right yeah yeah for sure and it makes sense because as you said in uh, in the beginning 
being it being a bit of a niche crop i'm sure the community is quite quite uh even even with competition and everything but it's it's still a community that's kind of close knit or has to be in a way so so information exchange uh and uh, also yeah just just uh talking about experiences and seeing what works what doesn't is must be essential um what other communication aspects would you say is maybe an area that you're trying to work on or uh, have planned that you aren't currently doing already? Well, yeah, it's uh, it's built on the same things, but I, I guess in a way, I, you are my we we also need to be a bit provocative in a sense, to, a, a little mm -hmm. in the terms of trying to push people to say, you know, um, you can do one trial now and do another one next year, but is that really going to move? things fast enough so there's a little bit of a an urgency <laughs> like in the big picture the example would be if you take the beer industry brewing there's there's been a lot of um, brewers and more specifically more brands are making commitments maybe they want to be carbon free by 2030 or mm -hmm. sustainable and whatever that definition is but it comes back to the supply chain to say well how are you going to get there and and it's all very fragmented you know you've got different breeders making different decisions on varieties, different monsters applying different practices and so on. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think is quite important is there needs to be some somebody speaking with a voice that's trying to bring all these together in some level, at least making people aware of what else is going on uh, and, and build upon that. So I think that and we use that events that we do, which is conferences and, and summits is bringing people together on, on similar topics to to say, you know, as a group, there's some good examples of sharing good examples and those best practices. People can take those away with them or you get them connected with people that are doing some of this work. And mm. uh, and one small step at a time, you kind of keep moving. And the, the, the ultimate goal would be to to reach those targets that people are striving towards. Um, and hopefully that they're not, they're not wildly different, that one brewer doesn't go one direction and someone else goes a different direction. And And mm -hmm. you start to back to my example of that there's a risk that if people are doing slightly different things, if you again put yourself in the shoes of the farmer or the boots of the farmer, it could end up being very complicated because different people are asking for different things and they're, they're, they're not so different, but they might be different reporting requirements and so on. So mm -hmm. if this isn't done properly, it could be quite could be quite uh, complicated. So there's certainly a need and some of these things are fairly early in the process. So And there's still an opportunity to influence it in, in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So maybe as a final question, you, you did mention the importance of ne these networking events and conferences besides the Insights Tours. Uh, w when's the next conference? Uh, and is there maybe something you'd like to highlight as far as the program or the concept there? Yeah, so uh, our main conference is every two years. We were in Antwerp in March of 2022 and in March um, of 2024, we're going to Rome. So we're going to a, a very, very nice destination. It's on the 5th to the 8th of March. And we will bring more or less 300 people from the global supply chain from all the major geographies of the world come together from the supply chain. And, and we'll have two days of discussion that are kind of touching upon all the key things to be considered. And uh, we, we probably won't, to be honest, we probably won't make a number of final conclusions because some of these things are are never finalized right the the journey on sustainability is a, a continuum so this yeah. is this is just to keep moving it ahead and keep bringing to life the the successes and and uh, also raise some of those questions of so what's next or can we move faster and and what are the roadblocks to um, to to speeding up so it's uh, there's never a never a lack of topics it's really for us uh, our biggest challenge to be honest is is we need to boil down to to get the right three or four topics on the agenda and get the right um, speakers there to to mm -hmm. inform people and and provoke some of that that thought once again like like you were mentioning earlier in other aspects of of the the barley business you have to stay on your toes and and make sure you you're really yeah you're where the relevancy is at the time so yeah um, yeah for sure and and it's it's a big world right so there's there's other industries there's mm. there's wheat for flour milling and and oil seeds for oil production edible oil and so on so so we're not in isolation there's there's right. as i said before there's lots of things 
impacting the world of barley. So you, you need to be careful not to just close in around yourself and just think that you've got it all figured out because, because invariably you won't. And, and it's actually better to, to be looking around to see what else is out there. You can learn from it and, and mm-hmm. also maybe try to be in, in parallel as much as possible. That'll certainly get us to a better place in time. For sure. Thank you so much, Brent, for uh, taking the time opening up your world to us and our Computomics podcast audience. It was really uh, awesome to hear um, yeah, your insights into the barley industry, uh, the trends we're seeing at the moment, and also get a little bit of uh, insider info on the conference that's going to happen in March 2024 in Rome. Um, as uh, our regular listeners will already know, um, but just in case, I'd like to mention it, uh, we will have all of this info in our show notes as well. So you can go to computomics.com and check that out. Um, and other than that, uh, Brent, I hope to maybe have you back at some time in the future so we can talk a little more barley for now. Just thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you.